Classical liberalism is the ideology that the United States and Republican France were founded upon. Today, Arkin the American will come on to talk about classical liberalism. So what is classical liberalism? Classical liberalism is a political philosophy that advocates for a limited, democratic-republican form of government designed to protect the rights and liberties of all individuals, with equality under the law, and a constitution to guard against the naturally authoritarian tendencies of government. What differentiates classical liberalism from neoliberalism? Properly understood, neoliberalism is not an ideology in the traditional sense, but rather a school of economics, although it has taken on certain ideological qualities. Some classical liberals may subscribe to neoliberal economic theory, while others, such as myself, may not. That being said, the two are certainly compatible. In that case, why don't you consider yourself a neoliberal? Neoliberalism, by its design, lends a great deal of power to large corporations, which, in my view, can be just as bad as, or sometimes even worse, than an overbearing government. A society cannot function properly when there are large corporations monopolizing entire sectors of the economy and having a high degree of influence in our government. What's your personal preferred economic system? I personally favor a system in which people are relatively free to exchange goods and services in a market economy, with an emphasis on small businesses and regulations to hold back the overwhelming corporate power that I spoke of earlier. What are your views on capitalism as a whole? Capitalism, although imperfect, is the greatest system thus far created through which to run an economy. Put simply, central planning does not work, and governments generally don't know how to run economies. Certainly, some regulations are necessary to prevent the abuse of workers or the formation of monopolies, but beyond these functions, regulation should remain minimal. Do you think any nations will ever adopt or restore classical liberalism? The most likely nation for a classical liberal revival currently is the United States of America. America was built on the principles of classical liberalism and republicanism, and although we've lapsed, these ideals are still in large part prevalent among the American populace. They're taught to our children in schools, they're inscribed in the halls of government, and they are indeed written into our constitution. Are there any places you think classical liberalism might be achieved in the near future? The next most likely candidates after America for a classical liberal revival are Britain and Ireland, both of which were very influential in the development of the philosophy in the first place. As for places where it has existed in the past, the Netherlands and America for about the first century after its founding both fit the bill, as well as arguably the Roman Republic. When it comes to Rome, do you believe its warning signs of collapse exist in the United States as well? Absolutely. Just as happened in the Roman Republic in its later years, America's ruling class has been swallowed up by corruption and self-interestedness, and as a result, populism is becoming ever more prominent in American political life. We've reached such a state of hyperpolarization that not even the most basic law can be passed, that any taboo can be broken, any law violated, any right trampled upon, so long as it's in the name of helping our side. Congress has devolved into little more than a political theater, keeping the masses riled up with empty arguments over meaningless minutia, while our institutions slip into an ever greater state of disrepair, and our people grow ever angrier. What do you think the solution is? America is in dire need of several key reforms, including but not limited to the nationwide implementation of a ranked choice voting system to allow for more parties, the abolition of gerrymandering, term limits for senators and congressmen, anti-lobbying legislation, an expansion of legislative power and reduction of executive power, a significant increase to the number of seats in the House of Representatives so as to allow for better representation, and the reenfranchisement of labor unions. However, long term, what America needs is a revival of the Republican virtues and of liberal democratic values from the bottom up because the foundation of any republic is the citizenry. How would an ideal classical liberal nation function? In very broad terms, we would have a government significantly reduced in size and power that allows its citizens to go about their lives with minimal interference. But beyond this, it's impossible to specify. Unlike communism or fascism, classical liberalism has no clear end goal, and most of us tend to reject the notion of such an end goal even existing. The quest for a utopian world has always been, and will always be, a futile one. What are your views on the American Revolution? 
The American Revolution, in my view, was the ultimate expression of liberal ideals, and the preamble to the Declaration of Independence was its ultimate codification. American colonists broke out in revolt against a government that failed to grant them the political representation they deserved, even after a decade of colonial outcry calling for this representation. Rights guaranteed to British citizens by their own Bill of Rights were systematically denied to colonists, because in a monarchy there are no citizens, only subjects. And so they took their fate into their own hands. Just government is built on popular sovereignty, and when it is denied, it is both the right and the imperative of the people to abolish this government and replace it with a better one. What are your thoughts on automation? I view automation in a similar light to technological revolutions of the past. While, yes, jobs will be lost and replaced, and the newly unemployed will need to find new professions, I'm not quite so apocalyptic in regards to automation as many others. We should take measures to negate the impact of automation on American jobs, but I think much of the rhetoric regarding it from figures like Andrew Yang is over-exaggerated fear-mongering. What would be an example of these measures to prevent the impacts? Let me spin you a yarn about the 90s. In the end of 1991, the Soviet Union came crashing down, ending the Cold War, and asserting near-total American hegemony over the globe. While this was a great victory for America and for capitalist liberal democracy as a whole, it also meant a lot of jobs in aerospace engineering were lost, what with the sudden lack of a major enemy nuclear power. To compensate for this, the government paid for their re-education into some other profession, and I believe that in the case of automation, we can attempt to do much the same for people who lose their jobs. What do you think about the climate crisis? Climate change is a very serious threat to our way of life, and yes, it is mostly caused by human activity. The first people to sound the alarms on climate change in the 80s were ExxonMobil, a company that makes money off the very fossil fuels that they allege cause climate change. Their predictions have been concerningly accurate so far, and what Americans need to understand is that we are the only developed country left where the climate change debate is still a thing. It is undoubtedly real, and we need to push for clean energy sources such as hydroelectric, geothermal, and nuclear. As for how we do this, subsidization has failed completely. The free market has very little incentive to adapt on its own, and the Green New Deal is a farcical joke. So I would suggest that the best recourse is incentivization through the use of taxes, to force companies to adopt cleaner energy. Those that fail to do so should have a carbon tax levied on them, while those that move towards clean energy should be given tax breaks. Do you believe in institutionalized racial inequality in America? No. There is no systemic racism left in America, the word systemic meaning that it is a part of our system. In legal and institutional terms, America is equal along the lines of race, though I will admit that some vestiges of segregation, such as redlining, still exist. On the individual level, racism is more prevalent, but still quite rare. Reality is that most people just aren't racist, and notions such as subconscious biases only exist to guilt well-meaning people into supporting social justice organizations. In terms of racial inequality, it comes down to socioeconomic status, not racism. Albeit that said status was attained in the first place due to racism. This is also why things like affirmative action and reparations for slavery will never work. Putting aside the absurdity of the moral justifications, trying to fix racial inequality with affirmative action or reparations is like trying to heal a deep gash with a band-aid. It addresses the effects rather than the causes. Those causes can more or less be narrowed down to our broken criminal justice and prison system, our dysfunctional welfare system, and a lack of black integration into wider American society. Segregation forced black people to develop along their own lines, creating what is now known as black culture. While this was useful as a survival tool in the era of Jim Crow, in the modern day, it does nothing but hold blacks back and fuel the ludicrous, racist delusions of the far right. What about economic inequality? What are your thoughts on it? A powerful middle class is the backbone of any modern republic, and so the rapid disappearance of the middle class is of great concern to me. Some might contend that the rich get richer, but the poor also get richer. While this is technically true, the rate at which they are getting richer is completely disproportionate. Since the 70s, the percentage of the population counted as middle class has dropped dramatically, with the majority of middle class folks nowadays either being wealthy enough to support themselves, or, as it is with most, spiraling slowly into poverty. A good way to measure this, I think, is not to compare the top 5% to the bottom, but rather to compare the top 5% to the top 1%. 
An example of this can be found in my own life. I grew up in a very standard middle-class American home and family. We do fine for ourselves, but we've never had anywhere near enough money to afford any kind of luxuries or high expenses. And yet, despite this, our tax returns for the last decade have shown us to be in the top 5% of income earners. At face value, most would imagine the top 5% as being rich. Yet, like I said, we live quite a standard, albeit comfortable, middle-class life. And so, examining the difference between a family like mine and any person in the top 1 or 2%, the difference between them is truly staggering, and demonstrates the true depth of our problem. As for solutions, among the many things we need to do, the first, and one of the most important steps, is to rejuvenate labor unions, so that lower and lower middle class workers can bargain for fairer wages. How would you respond to the debt crisis? The solution to the debt crisis, in concept, is very simple, but in practice, it's rather more complex. Our national debt is a result of the government spending more than is available to it. The solution, then, is to cut down on wasteful government spending in many of the areas where it is not needed, where it is needed but too much is spent, and where the government spends unwisely. However, at the same time, the government needs to have enough tax money to start lowering the debt, and this presents a problem because the only people who advocate for lower spending are also those who want lower taxes. The reason that Donald Trump has increased our national debt more than any other president in history is that he significantly cut taxes while doing nothing about spending. I, personally, would like lower taxes across the board, but I, along with everyone else concerned with national debt, have to accept that we can't repay it without retaining a moderate level of taxation for the time being. Who did you support in the 2020 election? With some reluctance, I threw in my lot with Joe Jorgensen of the Libertarian Party. Donald Trump is a national conservative populist, and I've talked in my own videos about the threat he poses. Given that I am socially liberal and a small-r Republican who is vehemently opposed to any form of populism, Trump just doesn't square with me. Joe Biden, meanwhile, although to me a clearly superior option to Trump, is the same thing that brought him and populism to center stage in the first place. I had, and still have, very little reason to believe that he'll meaningfully address any of the problems that brought about the rise of Trump. I live in a very blue state, which meant voting Biden or Trump would change absolutely nothing in the Electoral College, because Biden was going to win this state anyway, and he did by a huge margin. I'm a very strong opponent of the two-party system, and want sweeping electoral reforms to allow us to develop a multi-party system, which I have spoken about on my own channel at length. This left me with Joe Jorgensen as a candidate who I mostly supported, partly based on her policies, and partly to help grow the movement for third parties and electoral reform. In that case, what differences do you have with libertarians? The primary difference between classical liberalism and libertarianism is in terms of political philosophy. While libertarianism is based on the non-aggression principle, liberalism, and especially classical liberalism, is based upon the ideas of the Enlightenment. Human life in nature is nasty, brutish, and short, so to alleviate this, a state must exist. However, a state has its own problems, namely the tendency towards authoritarianism when unrestrained, and so the government must be limited in its scope by constitutional provisions. At first, this sounds very similar to libertarianism, but the differences lie in the non-aggression principle. For those unfamiliar, the non-aggression principle, or NAP, is the idea that the initiation of force against an individual or his property is inherently wrong, and libertarians tend to believe that the role of government essentially is to uphold this principle. Now, in my view, the NAP is a good ideal, but a purely unrealistic one, much like socialism and communism. It tends to be a pipeline towards radical, fringe ideas like anarcho-capitalism, because that is ultimately its logical conclusion. That's not even to mention the incredible vagueness of this principle. Does it only apply to individuals, or to governments as well? If, as some claim, corporations are people, are they also protected under the NAP? And what counts as aggression? If you pay someone to do your dirty work for you, but do no actual damage yourself, have you violated the NAP? Is, as anarcho-capitalists allege, the existence of the state itself an act of aggression? All these questions and more are too open-ended to have a concrete answer, yet all of them are questions that must be asked when considering the NAP. In short, while libertarianism trends towards having little or no government, classical liberalism is perfectly comfortable with the existence of a government, but believes it should be very limited in its scope. I will admit, however, that classical liberalism and libertarianism have a large overlap, and may even be used interchangeably, especially by those without strong beliefs on political philosophy.
How did you end up at your current beliefs? I suppose I've always held vaguely liberal values, molded into my specific set of beliefs and views by discussion, political introspection, and reading. I will admit that I strayed into the conservative sphere for some time, due to my troubles with the unethical mainstream media, disaffection with the Democrats, and watching just a little bit too much of right-wing YouTube. Throughout 2019, it became more and more clear to me that I was projecting my views onto Donald Trump and the Republican Party, rather than them actually representing my views. By the start of the coronavirus pandemic, I was thoroughly unhappy with our commander-in-chief, and his bungling of the pandemic didn't help. The final straw for me came on June 1st, 2020, when Trump broke up a peaceful protest and ordered the use of tear gas so that he could get a photo op. This is the stuff of tin pot dictators, and I wasn't going to stand for it. So it's at this point that I fully jumped ship. Do you have any closing thoughts? Well, I'd like to thank you for your time, and to commend you on your ability to ask probing questions that allow me to get to the core of the message I'm promoting, while simultaneously not engaging in the gotcha journalism that you'll often find in these kinds of interviews. Working with you for the past couple months has been a joy, and I'd love to do it again for whatever projects you may have planned. I'd also like to take this time to show my channel, Ark in the American, where I do political analysis and commentary through a liberal lens, albeit I try not to overtly reveal that lens in the interest of reaching as large an audience as possible, and so as not to create a bubble around myself. I have some videos planned on geopolitics and political history for the future, so if that kind of thing interests you, the link should be provided in the description. And with that shameless plug out of the way, I'd like to thank you once more for this interview, and bid you farewell. Thank you for coming on. You can find his links in the description below. Thanks for watching, and goodbye.